Hi, this is Brian Gracely, and in this installment video, we're going to talk uh, sort of a second part of cloud economics. In the first version of cloud economics, we talked about kind of higher level the things that are changing around the economics of cloud computing, um, the things that people need to be aware of in terms of um, you know, the changes between how to uh, acquire IT services through CapEx means, uh, how that's shifting to more OpEx means, what the some of the technologies are that are helping to drive that. But I thought what we'd do in this second part is really look at a more concrete type of example of, you know, where the costs are for cloud computing, both in terms of what a popular um, public cloud service, how they charge, and we're not making any assumptions about whether it's too expensive or not expensive enough or making really any market comparisons, but we're trying to make a, just establish what we, what we talked about yesterday was establish a baseline for flexibility, for cost, for the ability to re respond to business needs. And so we're going to look at how a, a very popular web service charges for their infrastructure as a service, and we'll compare this later on to things like software as a service, but, but let's use infrastructure as a service. So we understand the level of granularity that the service um, can charge at and, and make visible to customers, um, but also the things that as a, as a business, as an IT organization, as a line of business, as an application developer, you sort of have to be thinking about that maybe you don't think about today uh, that could impact the cost of you know, leveraging a public cloud service or looking at the cost that you may want to charge or expose internally. So let's look at a couple of the different elements or different areas that get charged for a public cloud service. Okay, we're just going to walk through them. Um, and again, uh, in this case, we're leveraging Amazon Web Services, which is a very well-known service. But this could be a number of different services in terms of public services. So we're not highlighting Amazon. We're just using it as a reference example. So uh, if we start off, the, the base thing that you're looking at if you're using their Elastic Compute service, or you're, you know, in essence, you want to get a, a virtual machine, because we're looking at infrastructure as a service, IaaS is the cost per CPU hour, right? So in essence, what we're saying is to get a Linux machine or a Windows machine, and if it's Windows, it's inclusive of a Windows license, or at least a temporary Windows license, or Linux OS, what's a cost per hour, right? So we're looking at um, the upside to this is it's purely per hour. So I can get it um, on demand. I can buy ahead of time what they call spot pricing. I can. Um, I can buy in different increments. I can buy ahead of time, I can buy at the market rate, I can buy on demand, but I'm gonna be buying things basically on a per hour basis. This is great if you need things on the short term, I just need it for six, eight hours. Um, if you need it for a longer term, there's some different ways you can buy that. Again, you can sort of pay ahead of time, you can essentially buy futures and things, but we're paying per hour for CPU. That's our starting point. The next thing we have to look at is, and let's, I sort of, I mean, these are out of order, so I've got CPU, I've got the compute. Now let's look at storage. And this is very important because there's multiple aspects to storage that people may not necessarily think about. If you're an application developer, you may only think about space. If you run the storage network, you think about things like I.O. or you think about backup and recovery. But let's look at how things are charged. They're charged per gigabyte, right? So raw space. It's charged by I.O. or hundreds of I.O., thousands of I.O., millions of I.O. But what that means is your application, you need as an application person, you need to be thinking about how much I.O. does this application generate, both inbound and outbound. And then it also has the option to charge you to do snapshots of your application, of your data, and so forth. So I have to be aware of all of these things. It's not just put a uh, SAN HBA in the back of the server and it'll be good and I'm sure I'll have plenty of bandwidth or, oh, the snapshots just get taken care of for me because that's what the backup team does. I have to be consciously aware of all these things, right? And the other thing to be aware of is charged per hour, charged according to different metrics. So we have to start thinking about, am I you know, charging per hour? Am I charging per gigabit of bandwidth that's being used or gigabit of storage that's being used or I.O., okay? A couple of cross-functional types of things. The next thing we're gonna look at is data transfer, right? So we, now we think about the network and how much bandwidth my application generates. But we also have to think about where my traffic's gonna go. And so bandwidth uh, or data transfer is charged in three sort of vectors. First is inbound traffic. Is there a charge for inbound traffic to access my application, inbound traffic to monitor my application, my instances? 
outbound, so traffic coming back out to my users or traffic going to other um, instances that might be part of a cluster or other instances that might be part of some other service that I access to complete my application. So both inbound uh, I.O. or you know, bandwidth and outbound I.O. in multiple directions. And the third vector that we have to be thinking about is what is the architecture? We have to understand a little bit about the architecture of these, these clouds we're using in terms of intra or interzone. So if I'm leveraging their concept of zones, you know, uh, geographically separated data centers or geographically uh, isolated um, instances or pods or data centers, how is traffic between zones monitored and measured and metered? So uh, we have to understand, um, does inbound and outbound traffic cover everything? Are there different charges for things to go intra-zone versus outside of zones? And this is very, very important for high availability, for uh, resiliency and disaster recovery. And we really have to understand this because we can, we can find that very quickly our bandwidth costs become much higher than we ever thought they were because we didn't really understand how our application worked. So we understand CPU, we understand storage, and now we understand the network, the three basic components of the infrastructure piece of this. The next things we want to look at, maybe we didn't think would be charges or we didn't think about them, is we could be charged by the number of IP addresses we use. We may be charged also for DNS services to be able to resolve that, whether they're public addresses or private addresses. So you have to look at how many addresses am I going to use, do I need them monitored, um, and are there costs associated with those IP addressing or DNS naming uh, attributes. The next is, do I want somebody, i.e. the cloud provider, to monitor my application? And this is typically monitored on a per instance, ties to the CPU, per month, right? Instances per hour, instances per month, right? So we got to do a little bit of math there to try and tie those things together. Uh, but this is a service that they'll provide, maybe some IT skills that you want to uh, outsource or aren't within the core of what you're trying to do. And then other services like load balancing. And again, this is per hour and per gigabyte of how much traffic. So this ties up to data transfer. So you see we've got some connectivity between this and this. We've got some connectivity between load balancing and, and data transfer. We've got data transfer storage. We've got to know what our application looks like to deal with things like I.O. So again, cross-functionally, we have to understand what does the application look like, how much space does it consume, how much I.O. does it consume, where is the traffic going to go, where do we expect the patterns to go. So taking all those things into consideration begin to help you understand what the economics of, of standing up an application might look like in a public cloud. On the flip side, it also gives you a sense of if people are going to try and do apples to apples comparison, so should I deploy an application internally in a private cloud? Should I deploy it externally in a public cloud? And they simply want to say, I need to do a, an economic comparison between these two things. These are the types of values that you're going to have to look at from a private cloud perspective to be able to match up apples to apples or at least you know apples to applesauce. So you're making some sort of reasonable comparison. Now, the other things that aren't really considered in this, well, um, do we have, let's look at a few things that might factor into your equation that uh, aren't necessarily considered in here, or at least explicitly called out, but you may need to think about them. How about, you know, core networking? How is that factored into your calculations, right? How is, um, you know, capital assets and, and depreciation factored in, okay? How are IT skills factored in, right? Monitoring sort of covers this. The fact that the service is up all the time and it's been architect is sort of covered in this. But from your perspective, if you're an IT organization, you're trying to measure against that, how are you going to do this? Are you going to take this and figure out the cost per hour across your IT skills? All those things need to be considered. And then in addition, you've got things like, you know, application licenses. Right? Those aren't factored in to these services. This is more of an OS level cost. But as you get into application software licensing, this may very well become a large factor in just your, your cost. They, they may be apples to apples between public and private clouds, but you have to factor those in as well. So uh, again, this doesn't go into all the economics, but I wanted to take the economic discussion a level deeper to be able to really look at what's under the covers of cloud economics using infrastructure as a service as an example, right? And being able to say, okay, 
I have to really understand my application. I have to understand what it looks like from a performance perspective, from an I.O. perspective, from a consumption of resources, bandwidth, storage, network resources, but I also have to understand what does the traffic flow looks like? How does that map to the architecture that we're leveraging, whether it's internally or externally? And being able to start to use these type of elements to help you in creating those baselines to measure economically, does it make sense for you to leverage public cloud services, uh, create internal private cloud services, or eventually maybe leverage a combination of both and what people tend to call a hybrid cloud uh, solution or hybrid cloud sort of portfolio. So hope this was helpful. Uh, again, trying to dive a little bit deeper so you have some visibility into what makes up the cost for cloud computing. And this is for an infrastructure as a service um, example. Things are probably a little bit different for software as a service because you're probably paying per user per month or some other factor. But this should give you a good starting point to understand what the economics will look like and things that you want to compare for your IT baselines versus things that you may want to use as an external service. Thanks for watching and thanks again.